Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Welcome to the Bread of the Word podcast, a podcast striving to feast on God's Word and let the Bible speak to us all. Let us, as a former generation said, go ad fontes to the fountain and be nourished and sustained by all that God is. Let's dig in together. Hello, and welcome back to yet another episode of the Bread of the Word podcast, where we go ad fontes to the fountain, to the Word of God, to be nourished and sustained by all that God is, as he has revealed himself to us. My name is Tyler, and we are... Continuing through the Song of Solomon, and we'll be covering the rest of chapter 6 today. We got a little bit into it last week, and so starting in verse 4, we're going to go all the way to the end. And so starting with the uh, the words of the man, there's a little bit of flip-flopping um, in this section, but starting with the man, you are as beautiful as Tizra, my darling, lovely as Jerusalem, awe-inspiring, as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they captivate me. Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes coming up from washing, each one having a twin and not one missing. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and young women without number. But my dove, my virtuous one, is unique. She is the favorite of her mother, perfect to the one who gave her birth. Women see her and declare her fortunate, queens and concubines also, and they sing her praises. Who is this who shines like the dawn, as beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awe-inspiring as an army with banners? The words of the woman, I I came down to the walnut grove, to see the blossoms of the valley, to see if the vines were budding, and the pomegranates blooming. I didn't know what was happening to me. I felt like I was in a chariot with a nobleman. Words of the young women. Come back, come back, Shulamite. Come back, come back, that we may look at you. And the man says, How you gaze at the Shulamite, as you look at the dance of the two camps. There is there is a lot here. There is a lot of imagery. Some of it is um, is recycled imagery. We've seen this a little bit um, as we've come as we have come closer to the the end of the book. That we're seeing some recycling of earlier phrases and ideas in the song that they are being brought back in here. And so some of what we read here we've seen before. We saw some of this in I believe chapter four with uh, the sheep and the pomegranate and some of that in the the opening section from the man but chapter I mean verse 4 you are as beautiful as Tizra my darling lovely as Jerusalem all inspiring as an army with banners and it's unique to me I think that in a in an expression of the beauty of his bride the man who is Christ draws on military terms. Tizra and Jerusalem are military cities. Awe-inspiring as an army with banners. There is a part of his expression of the beauty of his church draws on military imagery. If we go back to chapter 2. He brought me into the banquet house and his banner over me was love. There is, there is weight here. 
we have often we're, we're often tempted to try to divorce Christ the conquering king from Christ the lowly shepherd. But one thing this this book does is it puts the two together because we have war language in a love song. It doesn't work in our western our modern American way of looking at things. That love is love is passive, love is peaceful, love is delicate. But Christ in his love for his church has different aspects and they are all taken together that they are expressed together it's not it's not the love of god versus the justice of god but they work together god redeems us in his love in part because he is just <clears throat> so in this expression of his love for his bride he compares her to military terms as beautiful as Tizra, as lovely as Jerusalem, which are fortified cities. We talked about a locked garden last week. Now we are imprisoned in the love of God. Verse 5, Turn your eyes away from me, for they captivate me. The King James says, Ravish me. Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes coming up from washing, each one having a twin, and not one is missing. This is a direct callback to chapter 4, which says the exact same thing. Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from washing each one bearing twins, and none has lost his young. And so, it's, it, again, this is parallelism, so you have things that are said repeatedly in different ways, and they kind of complement each other. So, goats, sheep, teeth, washing, is white, is clean, is pure. Because that is how Christ looks upon his ransomed people as pure. When we talk about justification, to use the fancy theological term in the New Testament, that Christ has declared us righteous, what we mean is he has looked upon us and said, you are righteous. But not because of what we have within us. Because he knows the content of our hearts better than we ever will. But Christ has looked upon us in love and declared us righteous by his account as opposed to ours. And so he looks upon us as white like the sheep, as pure as freshly washed sheep. Behind your veil, verse 7, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. Whenever we see the word veil in the Song of Solomon, it is the Hebrew word points us back to a passage in Genesis describing Judah and something that went awry in the life of Judah. Let us look there for a moment. Long story short, um, Judah had a was deceived into a into an intimate activity with his daughter-in-law Tamar and the reason for that is that she lacked assurance that he would take care of her and so he she d disguised herself as a harlot and entered into relations with him And Judah is exposed as having done that. In verse 26, Judah recognized and said, She is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. That he recognizes, I did not take care of her, as I said. 
and he did not know her intimately again. When the time came for her to give birth, and there were twins in her womb, as she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it, announcing, This one came out first. But then he pulled his hand back, out came his brother, and she said, What a breakout you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez, and his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand, came out and was named Zerah. So we have, we have deceit and a strange family dynamic. And it is sandwiched in between the selling of Joseph in slavery and Joseph's arrest um, after he is lied about by Potiphar's wife. So we have a narrative of deceit here, of dishonesty, of manipulation, of a lack of reconciliation. And she, um, Tamar, she veiled herself. And that Hebrew word does not occur very often in the Old Testament, but it does occur in Genesis, and it does occur here in the Song of Solomon. We saw this even in chapter 1. Should I be like one who veils himself? That this is, it's the same Hebrew word for veil, but it's a different substance. That this is not the same story. That while this woman veiled herself to deceive and manipulate and extort, she is veiled, but it is shown within the context of beauty, of true intimacy, of love. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and young women without number. But my dove, my Yonah, my virtuous one, is unique. In Hebrew, it literally means complete. Because Christ views us as his ransom people who are beautiful and complete. My dove, my Jonah, is complete. She is the favorite of her mother, perfect to the one who gave her birth. Women see her and declare her fortunate. Queens and concubines also, and they sing her praises. And I believe that the other women in the Song of Solomon are best understood as those who do not know Christ. Either those who have yet to come to Christ, or those who will not come to Christ. Those who are on the outside. Long story short, we're talking about people that either do either do not know Christ or will not know Christ as outsiders in this relationship between the Shulamite and the man, who is Christ in the church. And so the outsiders see her and declare her fortunate. They recognize the value of this this marriage, of this union and communion she has with her husband. And it says they sing her praises. <clears throat> and the praises that they sing is verse 10. Who is this who shines like the dawn, as beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awe-inspiring as an army with banners? And to that, let us flip back to Genesis, back to Genesis 37. Right before the narrative with Tamar, we have the dream of Joseph, which uses similar language. So 37, picking up in verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Weird imagery, but in the Old Testament, we see a lot of dynamics of dreams having a certain substance to them. Now, we... We often don't think of dreams as having deep meanings nowadays, but that was a very com very common 
way of looking at things in the, the Old Testament era. And in the God-written books of the Old Testament, the dreams that we have written down for us are do have spiritual meanings. And so this is not... They didn't take this as you you have wheat bowing down. This 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 makes no sense. You need to stop eating the the snacks before bed. They th took this to, as having a very real meaning. Verse 8. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule us? And so they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Verse 9. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have said? He said, Am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And that begins a poetic device that carries through much of the Old Testament. If we flip over to the prophets and we look at, say, Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel uh, chapter 2 talks about the day of the Lord. Verse 2, a day of darkness and a day of gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness, like the dawn spreading over the mountains. A great and strong people appears, such as never existed in ages past, and never will again, in all the generations to come. This is a picture of something bad, something, something gloomy, something dark. We jump over to verse 10. The earth quakes before them, the sky shakes, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars cease their shining. So we have in Joel, which is, uh, you see this in a lot of the prophets. You have pictures of the sun, the moon, the stars growing dark. That the, the lights in the skies go dark. And that imagery goes back to G Genesis, because that is the first picture of Israel. Israel is likened to the sun and moon and stars as a government illustration of of Israel and sometimes of other nations and sometimes that is representing Babylon you see this again in the book of Revelation you see this in Isaiah that that's the sun and the moons grow dark and we know that when Christ was on the cross that the sky grew dark that the earth shook and the sky went dark. Again, we have this picture of judgment, of the great and terrible day. In one sense, because the sacrifice of Christ was a pouring out of God's wrath, of God's justice for sin. But it also testified to the stiff-necked people that was Israel that received the Messiah and handed him over to be crucified. In fact, um, Peter actually references this passage in Joel in Acts chapter 2. That this is what happened in... This is what Joel was talking about. In reference to Christ, whom you crucified. So the picture of the sun and the moon growing dark has judgment overtones to it. But the sun, the moon, and the stars points us to governments, to governmental structures in poetic imagery. So who is this who shines like the dawn, as beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awe-inspiring as an army with banners? It's verse 10, but notice the very last line of that, awe-inspiring as an army of banners. We saw that again at the beginning of this passage, awe-inspiring as an army with banners. That this it's being repeated by design when, when he when in Hebrew literature when things are repeated it's to draw emphasis that we have an awe-inspiring army with banners. 
in light of you are beautiful as Tizra in Jerusalem. Military terms. Who is this who shines like the dawn, as beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun? That goes back to Israel itself. And you, again, you have that, that governmental picture of God's people. But this is a different sun, moon, and stars than what we see in the Old Testament in substance, because Israel went astray. The Shulamite is not Gomer. The woman of the Song of Solomon is not like the woman of Gomer who strayed away. So much so that it says in Hosea, I will block her way with thorns so that she cannot find her, her lovers. But the book of Hosea with Gomer paints for us a picture of Israel and how they have gone away from the ways of God. Hosea chapter 2 says, This is what I will do. I will block her way with thorns. I will enclose her within a wall so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers but not catch them. She will look for them but not find them. Then she will think, I will go back to my former husband. For then it was better for me than now. She does not recognize that it is I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the fresh oil. I lavished silver and gold on her, which they used for Baal. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time, and my new wine in its season. I will take away my wool and linen, which were there to cover her nakedness. Now I will expose her shame in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her from my power. This is hard. <clears throat> this is again we have two sides of the way God deals with his people that he is he is loving and just at the same time we have both here just as God is a God of war as it says in Exodus we also have verse 5 turn your eyes away from me for they captivate me because our God is not stoic he is not detached from emotions but he feels things very deeply because emotions, if we really want to get into it, comes from God. That God is the archetype of feeling. But the significance of the sun, moon, and stars is that the church is the right sun, moon, and stars. That while Gomer went astray, the Shulamite is forever his. She is radiant in the beauty that God has given her because she is clothed in his righteousness so that she shines like the dawn. And how does the woman respond to such wonderful truth? Verse 11, I came down to the walnut grove to see the blossoms of the valley, to see if the vines were budding and the pomegranates blooming. I came down to see the flowers and the plants and the fruit. She came down to see what Christ has cultivated, what God has planted in his garden. Verse 12, I didn't know what was happening to me. I felt like I was in a chariot with a nobleman. The Hebrew word there literally is obscure. I was in a chariot with a obscure one. <clears throat> that is the position we are in as believers. That we are in a chariot with, with an obscure one, with a noble one. We are in the company of ones to whom we do not belong. I 
Romans 7. Some of us are very familiar with that passage. I do not do the good that I want to do. And the good that I do not want to do, I do not do. That is the conflict of us trying to be good. Is that we can't. There is no one good. Not even one. There is no one righteous. Not even one. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? But one with clean hands and an innocent heart, who has not lifted up his hands unto vanity. And he shall receive a blessing from the Lord. And the only way we can make sense of that psalm is to read it backwards. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? The one who receives a blessing from God. Who does not lift up his hands to vanity with an innocent heart and with clean hands. And the only reason those other things on top of it can exist is because we have received a blessing from the Lord. That Christ has blessed us with his righteousness. That he has atoned for our sins fully entirely and completely so that we can stand in his presence not by our own own merits not by our own virtue but solely on this gift of his grace that we are clothed with his righteousness that we are again imprisoned by the love of God (coughs) Deuteronomy 6 just to again refer to the Old Testament and the the reality of I'm not six sorry Deuteronomy seven they are going into the land they're they're going into the promised land and Moses in Deuteronomy is essentially giving the commencement address he is commissioning this next generation of Israelites to possess the land God has promised them. Verse 7, The Lord had his heart set on you and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. He brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. But he directly pays back and destroys those who hate him. He will not hesitate to pay back directly the one who hates him. So keep the command, the statutes and ordinances that I am giving you to follow today. In other words, direct your actions according to who God is because you are his we are a cho- we are a chosen people a holy priesthood a people for his possession we are we are not just different people but we are god's people second peter 2:9 says but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And the, Verse 10 there. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. And once you had received mercy had not received mercy but now have received mercy that is from the book of Hosea because the children that Gomer has are named not my people and no mercy because all of that was painting a picture of how Israel had regarded God so much so that the children of Gomer were named not my people and no mercy but God made them his people <clears throat> a 
and he bestowed on them mercy, not because they deserved it, but solely because of who he is. That by his grace, the church is a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. We are his. Not because of virtue, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. I came down to the walnut grove to see the blossoms of the valley, to see if the vines were budding and the pomegranates were blooming, to see what God has planted, what God is growing. And I didn't know what was happening to me. I felt like I was in a chariot with a nobleman. This is where we are. We are where we don't belong. Because God has brought us where we ought not to be. According to his grace and his mercy and his love for us. And he beckons us to come unto him. Come back. Come back, Shulamite. Come back that we may look at you says the young women and the man says how you gaze at the Shulamite as you look at the dance of the two camps and the two camps refers to the place in Genesis where Jacob and Esau found reconciliation where Jacob and Israel Jacob and Esau were reconciled as brothers and just as Jacob and Esau were reconciled as brothers, when Jacob brought gifts and offerings and bowed to Esau, so we are reconciled to God when we bow before him as God. When we offer gifts to him, when we tear our heart and not just our garments, not just what we have, but what we are. So as we continue working through the Song of Solomon in the next few weeks, let us continue to savor not just what Christ did, but who Christ is. For we know what? That God, we know the love of God. How? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, it says, at the right time. But through Christ, we now have access to God through faith. This is the Christ in the Song of Solomon. This is the beloved who came down the mountain with the strength and the swiftness of a deer or a young heart who brought us into his banquet house and placed a banner over us of love. Christ has loved us and does love us with an everlasting, indescribable, incomparable love. Savor that. Treasure that. Thank God for that. Because, as it says in Psalm 139, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my thoughts and art acquainted with all my ways. And yet, Christ still died for what he saw. Christ lived and rose for what he saw. That we would be reconciled to him 
by himself. Once we were not a people, but now we are his people. Ponder that this week. Thank you for listening. This has been the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is a podcast ministry striving to feed people the wonderful words of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, striving to let the word speak for itself. This ministry is also a member of the Truth and Love Network, a diverse fellowship of fellow podcasts of different theological backgrounds united in the gospel of God. For more from the Bread of the Word podcast or the Truth and Love Network, check out the links below and follow us on social media. Until next time, God bless. Matthew 4.4.